And earlier, I spoke to Dr. Robert Malone. He's a biochemist, and his early work helped develop mRNA vaccine technology. I asked him for his reactions to the Veritas Pfizer video. Here's what he told me. And joining me to talk about the Veritas Pfizer video is Dr. Robert Malone. He's a biochemist whose early work with mRNA vaccine technology was pioneering. Now, it's been a few days uh, since uh, Veritas released that video. I wonder if, if anything's changed. What concerned you the most watching the video? Frankly, my emotion uh, when I was first presented with the embargoed video, uh, which so that's the one that doesn't have the clips in it with me, was I, my reaction was entirely emotional. I was just stunned by what I was seeing in terms of the attitude and behavior of the gentleman, this MD, very young MD with a very senior position in Pfizer. I think he's two or three down from the uh, Borla, the chief executive. Uh, I, I didn't have an emotional reaction or concern about the genuineness of this. I know that that's been raised repeatedly, but that it came across to me as very genuine. I think we do need to acknowledge that it's highly edited, which is typical of Veritas, that's their style. And also that it, it seems to very much uh, be a case of um, this, uh, of subterfuge in some way. Clearly the physician, young physician has, is in a bar. He's probably had a couple of drinks. Uh, he seems to be um, flirting with the subject that's asking the questions. Uh, so that that was a little odd, um, but but typical of what Veritas does um, when they when they capture these types of uh, events is is they often use this subterfuge to get uh, their targets, the people that they're trying to get to speak freely, uh, to reveal themselves. There's another video from Veritas that's similar to this. That's a government employee. I don't remember if he works for the FDA or for BARDA in which he said some very similar things, such as the rotating door relationship between Pfizer, I'm sorry, between pharma and the government. Uh, so I was, I was stunned by the content, uh, completely stunned by the, the corporate culture and the personality that seemed to be reflected in this person that was, you know, ostensibly a very senior worldwide research director responsible for RNA strategy. I mean, this is somebody who is in a position to profoundly influence our all of our lives? Uh, and you know, Pfizer is in many, and Pfizer and Moderna are advancing over 50 RNA-based vaccines in the United States right now, and uh, over 200 clinical trials for other RNA products are planned. So this gentleman is sitting at the center of that, um, and he's describing a series of studies in behaviors and activities in Pfizer that appear on their face to be deeply corrupt. And uh, he's happy about it. He's casual. He's just joking about it. He shows absolutely no signs of remorse, except for um, the caveats, caveats that he says, uh, well, please don't tell anybody this, uh, you know, in, in a kind of a conspiratorial way. It, it's an amazing clip, even though it is highly edited and was captured in a, at a, in a way that the target was not aware that he was being interviewed. And in an environment where probably he's had more than one thing to drink, and he seems to be flirting with the uh, the the male uh, a reporter who's acting on behalf of Veritas, who I've come to understand later. I've actually spoken to him, but not seen his image. Uh, he's apparently an ex-Pfizer employee. So there's also this uh, esprit de corps that you can see in the video between two people that have worked for the same company. Now, you, you said uh, it was shocking to you. Uh, what specifically that Walker said made you feel this way? All of the content was amazing. I mean, just, just segment after segment after segment. Of course, like I said, it's highly edited, so Veritas has pulled out the shocking content, and that's what we're seeing. We're not seeing the you know, mundane interactions that probably interspersed those clips. So is I want to... You know, I, I, I want to ask you, when, when Walker said, you know, quote, why don't we mutate it ourselves and preemptively develop vaccines? Now, you're a professional in this, uh, in this field. What is he talking about? Um, first off, let's, 
let's be clear that the, the buried lead in all of this is that this is an implicit acknowledgement that Pfizer is not able to produce the product that would be necessary to get out ahead of this virus and allow people to be protected using a vaccine. This is that what is being deployed here, what is being said is a implicit acknowledgement that the products aren't working and they can't make it them work without going to extraordinary measures of these genetic manipulations, which they hope might solve their problem of getting out ahead of the virus evolution. What they're describing is um, almost identical to what was done at the Wuhan, apparently done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I mean, the only major difference in what he described from what was done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology were number one, the purine site is already in the backbone. So he's not talking about putting in a new function. He's talking about modifying domains of the virus. Uh, and he's talking about serial passaging in monkeys, as opposed to what was actually done in Wuhan Institute of Virology, giving the devil its due, was more sophisticated in that they used humanized mice for those studies. And serial passage, this infecting one monkey and then taking virus from that monkey and putting it into another and to another and to another demonstrates, this is what bothers me the most, it demonstrates an immunologic naivete on, at Pfizer. Remember, this is a senior Pfizer executive responsible for strategic planning. At one point in the second interview where he's, he's confronted by James O'Keefe, he says, I'm not a scientist. And yet he's holding this profoundly um, powerful uh, position of high responsibility for directing the science. What What's wrong underneath what he's saying is the logic that the virus is escaping and obtaining new characteristics only because of its ability to mutate certain epitopes, presumably in the spike protein. That's absolutely false. And it, and it demonstrates that this gentleman really doesn't know what the heck he's talking about in terms of the immunology and the molecular virology that's going on. But what they seem to believe is that they can uh, generate mutant viruses, just as was done in Wuhan, uh, or appears to be done in Wuhan, and then somehow obtain viruses that are more pathogenic or more infectious, that are escaping vaccination. And then once they've developed those, then they can potentially develop a vaccine against those so what they're, what they're really talking about is accelerating, attempting to accelerate in a more controlled environment using monkeys instead of humans, which have very different immune systems, uh, so that they can anticipate the evolution that the virus is going to take. Now, there's, there was these casual joking conversations about um, the release, the potential for inadvertent release of the virus into the population and how that could be good for Pfizer's business. They talk, he talks about a cash cow relationship where wouldn't it be great if they could design more pathogenic or more infectious virus and design the vaccine. And then when, you know, it's, he leaves it a little ambiguous. Should that virus somehow enter the population, then they would already have the product for it. So this is the, the slang that's often used is this is a self-looking ice cream cone where they create the problem and the solution at the same time and then sell us the solution once the problem either manifests or somehow inadvertently ends up in the general population, such as happened in Wuhan. This, this is profoundly disturbing. Even, the, even just the fact that this gentleman would joke about this is profoundly disturbing. Now, he, he, he called this a uh, directed evolution, right? And then I think you have mentioned, you're saying this is gain of function uh, uh, research. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? What's the dy dynamic here? This is really parsing of words or substituting one set of words for another that really are equivalent. Or if they're not equivalent, they are so close to each other as to be um, uh, irrelevant, the decision, the di differences between the two words. Technically, one could define gain of function research, which by the way is poorly defined, as only involving the insertion of a new genetic element into a virus. You could define it that way, or you could define it um, in the more normal way. Anything that you do in mutating a virus genome to cause it to have different properties would be gain of function. It has gained different properties by definition. And in his case, he's talking about g obtaining different immunologic properties. So to call this directed evolution versus gain of function in technically in directed evolution, 
you could say that um, natural selection of farm animals is directed evolution, technically. When, we, when I breed horses, I choose to breed that stallion to that mare because I think that together they will have something better than each of them separately. So that's directed evolution. Um, when anybody breeds a dog or a farm animal or anything else, that's what they're doing functionally. But what Pfizer is talking about doing is, is much more subtle. And it's really, I think, an inappropriate use of the term in the way that this gentleman is using it. But what he's trying to do is substitute a more benign term for one that has become very uh, widely understood to be wrong, to be illegal in the United States. And he's making a joke out of it. And, and he's, he's clearly acknowledging in the video that the, um, the two things are really the same functionally, but for uh, purposes of really PR for Pfizer. Um, it appears that he's been instructed to use the term uh, directed evolution in lieu of the term gain of function. And somebody mentioned to me this morning, uh, if they're doing this kind of research uh, in labs, if it never leaks, what's the harm here? It always leaks. There, as we saw in Wuhan, the, the, the thesis here that there is perfect containment capabilities is clearly flawed. I heard a, a great metaphor for this. What we're dealing with with this kind of gain of function research and bioterrorism and biowarfare and, and dual function research is another uh, euphemism for what's going on here. It's dual function in that it has a civilian capacity and also a military capacity. The same research can yield a weapon or something that could be defensive or used for civilians. So that's, that's dual function. Um, in the case of, let's say, nuclear war, one engineers a, a weapon, a profoundly destructive weapon, and it is engineered in such a way that there are multiple, multiple events that have to happen, tests, switches have to be performed, secret codes have to be entered. There are multiple barriers to the deployment of a nuclear weapon. In the case of a biologic weapon, like what is functionally potentially coming out of this or appears to have come out of Wuhan, uh, what you have is you've engineered something metaphorically that's akin to a nuclear weapon, perhaps even more destructive. I mean, what we've just seen in the last three years is more destructive in terms of loss of life than any nuclear deployed nuclear weapon has been. So you're engineering something that has the killing potential, the destructive potential equivalent to a major nuclear warhead. And um, it is sitting in a bench environment in which if anybody makes an inadvertent mistake, if the technician sweeping up the feces in the monkey room has a hole in his protective gear because he just caught it on a nail, you know, anything can happen. And one small event, inadvertent, one single point of failure can lead to the entry of a lethal pathogen into the general human environment. And we have seen how quickly that can spread. That's why this logic is, is wrong. It is fallacious. It is deeply flawed. This analogy, what's wrong uh, if so long as they're in BSL-4 is what you're saying. And, and BSL-4 can go bad in so many ways. You can have a brief power fluctuation so the air pressures are no longer equalized and suddenly things that are a positive pressure to keep the virus in is suddenly reversed. Um, somebody can inadvertently throw a switch, open a door, like I said, tear a suit, um, you know, a monkey can throw feces and, and somebody hits it, you know, or, or sprays urine. This is, this is what monkeys do. Uh, and, and people get inadvertently infected in these facilities all the time. And uh, to, to like to say that this is a benign, the only people that could say that would be the ignorant. Anybody who has worked in any of these facilities is familiar with what goes wrong and what can go wrong. And in the U.S. government's case, if the CDC and the NIH have gone wrong again and again and again, there are multiple, multiple examples of breaches of biocontainment. And it's just part and parcel with this type of work, which is why this work must be prohibited. It is too dangerous. It cannot be safely controlled. 
it is grossly irresponsible for a pharmaceutical company driven by a profit motive who is not particularly invested in ensuring safety, as you can see from the gentleman's casual attitude, uh, to, to be doing this type of research that puts the entire population of the world at risk. I mean, the, if, if I'm amazed that the entire world is not up in arms over this. Um, you know, some people are, uh, and, and um, I understand Marco Rubio now has sent a very strong, strongly worded letter to uh, Boria. Um, uh, but the, the people of the world should be stunned. We have this enormously powerful, extremely wealthy global pharmaceutical company that seems to have no moral boundaries. And, and you mentioned why the world isn't up in arms. That leads to uh, my next question about, I don't really see you know, national news uh, covering this or main, mainstream media. And, and I'm sure you know about the labels uh, on, on Google and YouTube and, and the like. Maybe just talk a little bit about that. So stunningly, one of the largest publications in the world, the Daily Mail in the UK, uh, published an article about uh, the Veritas leak immediately and it was taken down. You can't find it except by going to the Wayback Machine. The search terms having to do with Pfizer and Veritas were modified because they started trending by Google immediately. In the same way that Google did after I spoke those three words on Rogan just a little over a year ago, mass formation psychosis. Google, when it noticed that this was trending, immediately started modifying search results and making it so that people could not search for these terms and identify that video. Then what happened, and it was stunning in how fast it happened, that the, this physician and everything to do with this physician on the web worldwide was memory hold within hours. Everything, his LinkedIn profile, all, fortunately many people had already captured screenshots of, of slides when he was in medical school. Um, uh, I have uh, screenshots that have all of his personal capture, his personal contact information, which I've chosen not to share because I don't want to be responsible for doxing him. I think that's a, a boundary that we should respect. But um, all of that has been completely scrubbed from the internet. You cannot find it. And then suddenly a campaign started asserting that he didn't actually work for Pfizer. Um, that he maybe wasn't even a real physician. And all over the internet, you started hearing people, often trolls and bots, um, advancing the logic that this was entirely fake, that James O'Keefe had been um, somehow catfished, um, that I should watch out because I was endorsing something that was probably fake. And uh, this is a coordinated campaign. Simultaneously, Pfizer turned off comments in all of their various media platforms. They are not allowing anybody to comment on any of their platforms. And on Twitter, they allow only people that they follow to comment. Okay, so only their friends can say anything. and They block the ability of the general public to say anything on any Pfizer platform. The, the, the power of Pfizer to completely control the media narrative, except in um, outlets such as NTD Business, and uh, fortunately, Tucker Carlson last night, that's the first time any major, and then Fox News this morning, I'm understanding has broadcast my segment of that clip where I speak, but deleted the parts where Tucker was uh, um, viewing, uh, broadcasting the clips from the Veritas video. I, the, the power of Pfizer and its money is profound. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 and I want to talk about another thing that uh, that Walker mentioned in that uh, video. He talked about a revolving door with uh, officials and pharma and other industries. Tell us what is the problem? What, what's the inherent problem here? So it's multiple. What what it creates is sort of a forward-looking conflict of interest in government officials. Government officials are busy working for, you know, somewhere between, you know, for the more significant positions, 125,000 a year to 250,000 a year uh, with benefits, and then only the, 
the top, 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 like Tony Fauci, end up in the kind of 400,000 a year um, bandwidth. For Pfizer, for a, a starting salary for uh, a experienced um, senior person, that's starting at about 300 and goes to a million or more. So you end up, the, the most graphic example in the current situation is Scott Gottlieb, former director of, this, of the FDA, quits his position or leaves his position. He takes a two-month vacation, which is all that the law requires. And then he goes to work uh, for Pfizer, I think, on the board of directors. So he's now a Pfizer employee. And um, we know from the Twitter files, as one example, uh, when Brett Gior, someone who is much more seasoned than Scott Gottlieb in the government, had a position as Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, so that was two or three ranks above Scott Gottlieb, post something on Twitter um, speaking about the benefits of natural immunity. Scott Gottlieb contacts Twitter and arranges uh, for Brett Gior's tweet to be censored. Clear conflict of interest. He has exploited his position as a former government official. What happens here is that this is, I don't know how, for those who haven't encountered this, this is completely the norm. Uh, for instance, if you want to work in patents and trademarks, you're a lawyer, you're a patent lawyer, you go and work for the US Patent and Trademark Office for two to three years, and then you leave and you go join a big law firm. And during that period, if you have cases come to you uh, that have to do with issues that are important in industry or for the future law firm that you're gonna join, and you're, you give very, very favorable judgments, um, then you're much more likely to get that big ticket job when you get out. It's a it's a kind of a payola. It's a forward-looking conflict of interest. You scratch my back today, and I'll scratch your back tomorrow. I'll give you the big salary when you get out if you just behave. And the converse is also true. If you don't behave, you will never get one of those good jobs. So, and it doesn't matter if you don't behave in on a Pfizer case if you're a regulatory officer. If you don't behave the way they want on a Merck case, then not only will Merck not hire you, but neither will Pfizer. It's an industry-wide thing, and it has deeply, deeply compromised um, all of these agencies that have um, often, you know, almost all of them have what's called a dual function or a dual responsibility, like the FDA or the CDC. The CDC is a great example. The CDC has a mission of promoting vaccines and regulating and overseeing the safety of vaccines. The Federal Aviation Agency has a dual function of promoting a aviation and regulating av aviation. And we saw how that played out with the 737 MAX scandal. This problem is systemic through the entire government. You know, we see Monsanto leadership routinely swapped back and forth between leadership of the USDA. That's what has happened in, uh, in Washington, D.C. and uh, most of the public is completely ignorant of it. And then we see this video where this gentleman, you know, blithely acknowledges what anybody that works in DC, DC knows is to be the case. Um, but he does it in such a overt way. It's, it's so casually, um, as a, as a kind of a matter of fact, he's speaking to this person that, um, he's on a date with and he's trying to impress him apparently according to him. And, uh, he's saying, well, don't you already know this? I'm such an insider. I know this. Didn't you already know that? That's that's the subtext of what he's saying is he's kind of trying to show how important he is because he knows this is the way D.C. works. What he doesn't realize is the person that's uh, speaking to him is a reporter who knows exactly how D.C. works, but uh, bet on him. So I hope that helps, you know, eliminate what this revolving door problem is. It is deep and profound. And as he mentioned as well, the people who are impacted here are the American people. Another thing that was stunning, this casual admission that it's good for corporations, it's good for Pfizer, it's not good for the American people. He says this as a, as a joke. He's smiling and laughing about it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's grotesque. It's ghoulish. Um, he's talking about, he's laughing about um, one of the most profound human tragedies in modern history, the corona crisis over the last three years. And, and he has no sense of uh, decorum. He's completely immature. And uh, he's, he seems to have absolutely no empathy. Uh, you know, I, I deal with 
and I'm trying to speak for the dead and the vaccine damaged who have no voices, who have also been deplatformed and censored. Um, they and gaslit, the gaslighting that's occurred here is amazing. These people are deeply damaged um, and uh, they have no allowed voice and um, no one will hear them. No one even acknowledges that they exist officially. Uh, and in the face of this huge human tragedy, you have this young physician joking about um, doing the very type of work that led to the tragedy in the first place. What do you think we can do about this uh, revolving door issue so that there's independence? So I talk about that in the book. It is a huge problem. Uh, it's one that is must be solved uh, legislatively, I'm afraid. And uh, the, the challenge is that we have laws on the books for good reason that limit um, the ability of companies to restrict future employment. And the federal government is basically deferring to those uh, policies and those laws and state laws. But the federal government has the ability to just say no. They don't have to follow along with that. They don't have to follow established case law. The, the House and, and the Senate could absolutely legislate that a condition of accepting employment with the federal government with all the benefits that come with it. And these people have huge pensions. Um, you know, they're, they're taken care of for life. That's why ostensibly you used to join the government is you knew that you weren't gonna make as much money as you could make in the private sector, but you had stability and some assurance that you were gonna have um, uh, benefits upon retirement. You know, the likes of you and me and most of the people listening here, those benefits are long gone. Uh, you know, I have I have no benefits from all of the labor that I've done except for Social Security, which is probably not going to be there when I need it because the Social Security fund is about to go bankrupt. Um, most people no longer have those pensions that our parents had in the 50s and 60s, but government employees do. They have incredible health benefits. And uh, I the, the social contract in the past has been we, the people, provide them these benefits in exchange, they functionally agree to um, serve our interests, um, to focus on our interests, act as agents to us, instead of just pursuing their own personal benefit and their own personal interests. And clearly, that culture has been destroyed. And so the legislature is going to have to step up and make law that says, if you're going to work for the federal government, you're not going to do this anymore. No more of this, oh, two months, and then you're free. Remember the same a revolving door for those that remember uh, the the uh, movie. Uh, what was it called? Uh, the Big Short. Remember The Big Short, that movie about the Wall Street crisis of, of 7 and 08? In that, they specifically talk about the Securities and Exchange Commission corruption based on exactly the same process, that the Security and Exchange Commission looked the other way because their employees were all literally in bed or anticipating jobs with the Wall Street firms that they were ostensibly regulating. It's the same problem. We have known about it for decades, and we have done nothing about it. In fact, what's happened is the lobbyists for these companies have caused the federal government to relax the laws even more so that it becomes even more of a problem. We, we are in a situation because and it all traces back, as Tucker said last night, to the decision to allow the pharmaceutical industry to directly market to consumers, which is only allowed in one other country in the world. I mean, even China, um, you know, NTD News is very sensitive to what goes on in China, but you're not going to see advertisements for Chinese pharmaceuticals on the street in China. It doesn't happen, right? They don't treat that industry in the same way. They know what it can do. I mean, if we're, if we're, if we're really going to build the China solution that seems to be so popular in our government right now, um, even there, they don't allow this. This is rapacious capitalism. The pharmaceutical industry lobbied, and it, I'm sorry, it was Bill Clinton and Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, that pulled this off. Um, and surprisingly, I've never spoken about this before, but um, when that was that legislation was put in place that allowed um, unrestricted pricing on drugs, the government would no longer negotiate on drugs, and they allowed uh, direct marketing to consumers through advertising. Um, strangely, this mega 
Swiss pharmaceutical company, Novartis, moved their capital, their headquarters, global headquarters, to Boston. Um, I think any of your viewers can, can, can connect those two points with a line. We have a problem here in the United States, and we have to recognize it before we can do anything about it, and, and then we have to get mad. This is something that really merits anger. I, I generally do not try to, I try very hard to not support anger and to not promote it, but this is something that absolutely merits anger, whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, and a Libertarian, this is something that, that does, you should be angry about because it's hurting you and your children. Right, right. And I just want to wrap up here. So one last thing very quickly, maybe in, in a couple of sentences about this video, just spell it out for us very plainly, very simply, what is unethical? What we see in this video that's so profoundly unethical is the willingness of a pharmaceutical company to surreptitiously engage in genetic engineering to produce more potent viruses so that they can engineer solutions to those viruses in the form of vaccines, as well as the blithe um, acceptance and willingness and really celebration of uh, the corruption of the regulatory apparatus of the United States and really the world. That's when the, when the gentleman speaks about the revolving door and, and the reality of what Pfizer has engineered. What he's doing is celebrating that Pfizer and the entire industry has profoundly corrupted a huge sector of the American government. And they have, um, there's, there's no shame. They, they take that as um, a huge success. What's also uh, really profoundly corrupt is celebrating that this COVID crisis, this profound crisis that has affected the entire world is perceived by Pfizer as a cash cow, as a, as a profit opportunity. That's how they see it. They're, he's acknowledging that Pfizer has an incentive to prolong the crisis, which surprisingly or not, seems to be exactly aligned with the position of the current president, who seems also to seek to prolong the crisis for some reason. Right, right. And Dr. Malone, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Appreciate your time. Always a pleasure having you on the show. Always my pleasure to help you in NTD business in any way I can.